Hello again. So we're starting a new unit which covers two historical eras, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And uh, so as I said last time, maybe the first thing to keep in mind is that these are two distinct different eras. And although it's not ideal, they are both going to be presented in one unit and we're going to have one test that covers both eras. So it's important to try and keep in mind that they are different eras and there are going to be things that are true for one era but not true for the other era. So don't kind of keep them all lumped in as one thing just because we're, we have one chapter in the book or because we have one test. Two, two very different things actually. Uh, another thing I think to keep in mind is that once we get started talking about historical eras, um, we should we should keep in mind that these are kind of artificial constructs that are created by people, by historians, in order to uh, simply uh, just simplify our thinking. You know, we have a tendency to create categories or genres. Think of all the different types of music there are. And you go into a record store, <laughs> it's 1975, uh, or you're searching uh, through iTunes, through, you know, different genres. And it's important for people to know sort of like which bin to look in, right? So we have this natural tendency to want to organize and to sort of wall things off from each other so that we can help make distinctions between them and understand them. Um, so uh, we should think of, for example, the, the dates that are given for these different eras. They are important. They are definitely good to know, but uh, they aren't really something that's real. As I said last time, nobody woke up, let's say, on January 1st of 1450 and said, oh, thank God the Middle Ages are over. Now it's going to be the Renaissance. Things are going to be cool. Okay. So, and another thing about these eras, usually the term for the era is applied later by people who came afterwards and who may have noticed a change and said, wow, things are different now than they were before. And those are the people that come up with the label that is applied to the previous era. So nobody in the Middle Ages knew they were living in the Middle Ages. Nobody used that term during that time. Okay, so uh, we'll start with the Middle Ages and focus on that for, I don't know, a week, a week and a half, and then we'll get to the Renaissance. Now, the very first thing among the first things to know about the Middle Ages, one thing to, to know is that we sometimes use the term medieval rather than Middle Ages. Medieval and Middle Ages mean the same thing. Medieval literally means basically the time in between. Medi, the M-E-D-I -E part, means in between, like medium. And Middle Ages refers to something that's in the middle, okay? So what's it in the middle of? Why was it called the Middle Ages? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because on the one hand of uh, the Middle Ages, we have the ancient world, right? We have ancient history, which ends, let's say, with the fall of the Western Roman Empire around 450 or so. Now, even that, very misleading. When people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, what they usually mean is the fall of the Western Roman Empire, sort of the European half of the Roman Empire. There was an Asian half, um, which continued on actually for another thousand years. It's sometimes known today as the Byzantine Empire. But back then, nobody called it the Byzantine Empire. They called it the Eastern Roman Empire or just the Empire. But it was the Western Roman Empire which fell around 450 AD. Um, did it just kind of topple over? No. There was a long period of decline. And what we call the fall of the Western Roman Empire is really just sort of a decay or a degradation of the authority of the emperor. And that unifying authority, um, as it broke down, was kind of taken over by regional, let's say, kings or tribal chiefs or other people in positions of power. So this is a very important principle of history, by the way. If you have a group or an entity in power, 
and as it starts to fall from power, as it inevitably will, somebody or somebody's or some some institution will be there and willing to take up that power vacuum, right? When power goes away, it doesn't just go away, it's replaced by some other power. We'll see this over and over again uh, as we look at these different eras of history. Okay, so the significance of that first date, 450, or around 450, again, because it's a gradual process, that marks the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, well, what was so significant about the fall of the Western Roman? Well, it was actually significant. When the authority of Rome broke down, um, several things happened. First of all, there was a, uh, a major decrease in trade and travel because the roads were no longer maintained. Right? This is one of the reasons why, for example, Latin uh, sort of diverged into the various Romance languages. Right? Uh, so today we have people in France who speak French, in Spain who speak Spanish, Portugal who speak Portuguese, in Italy who speaking Italian, in Romania speaking Romanian. Well, all of those are Romance languages. That is, they are languages that are descended from Latin. But as these different populations didn't communicate with each other very much, they didn't travel, they didn't trade as much, the, the languages became more and more distinct until they became basically separate languages. Um, so another uh, fact of the, the breakdown of the, the Roman Empire is that um, as that authority of the empire broke down, um, as I said, some of that, that power was taken up by regional tribal chiefs, kings, whatever, but a great deal of it was actually taken up by bishops, by the church. Now, keep in mind, the late Roman Empire was a Christian empire. When we think of the Roman Empire, we probably think of Christians being persecuted and uh, being fed to the lions in the Colosseum and all that. And there was a great deal of persecution of Christians up until roughly the 320s AD, when the empire was basically converted to Christianity by the first Christian empire, Constantine the Great. Right. After that time, with a few little relapses, after that time, we're talking about a Christian empire. So it's kind of interesting that um, uh, Christianity, which started out as a sort of a, seen as a, as a strange offshoot of Judaism, a, a kind of a, an odd little cult, that's the way the, the pagan Romans saw it, um, and certain uh, emperors, of course, tried to persecute Christians. Well, ultimately, Christianity conquered the Roman Empire uh, because the empire was converted to Christianity, and it was the Roman Empire which is responsible more than any other entity for spreading Christianity. Christianity was a fairly obscure and uh, small religion until it was until it was made sort of official, until it was adopted by Constantine the Great. And, and spread throughout the entire empire. And if any of you watching this video uh, are a Christian, it's probably in large part because of Constantine, because if it hadn't been for him, Christianity might have uh, stayed a fairly small and obscure um, kind of sect, right? Instead of the, the world's largest religion as it is today. Okay, so um, the church kind of filled that power vacuum that was left behind. Because even though these various uh, ethnic peoples or tribes or whatever were no longer under the, the authority of Rome, they were all, pretty much, Christians, right? And there was an existing power structure of bishops and other clergy who uh, filled, again, that, that authority of uh, that a vacuum of authority that was left behind as the apparatus of the Roman Empire uh, kind of disintegrated. Okay, so I'm going to talk this, about this a little bit more and the implications of this and how it ultimately relates to music. But first I want to talk about the other end of the Middle Ages or the medieval. And that is the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire around 1450. And again, the Eastern Roman Empire long before 1450, had suffered serious problems. 
and its territory was ultimately confined to really just the capital city of Constantinople, uh, which is today modern-day Istanbul. It's the, the largest city in modern-day Turkey. Constantinople was a, a new capital founded by the Emperor Constantine. So Constantine not only converted the empire to Christianity, he also built a new capital, moved the capital away from Rome to Constantinople for various reasons. Um, and so Constantinople was the, the, the capital of that eastern half of the empire, and that, that uh, empire continued on for another thousand years. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to trace out the various reasons why the fall of Constantinople and the end of the eastern empire, and that the city was taken by the, the Ottoman Turks, and it was made their empire, it was made the capital of the Ottoman Empire after 1453 when the city was taken. Okay, well, what's so significant about that? Why does that mark the end of the Middle Ages? Well, it's basically because historians have traditionally done it that way. They've looked at the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire and said the time in between is the Middle Ages. Now, there were many significant sort of after effects of the, um, the, the fall of Constantinople, which we can maybe get to when we, when we talk about the Renaissance. There were significant effects, especially to the, the rise of the Ottoman Empire. And when they finally took that city of Constantinople, it cut off some very important trade routes to places farther east, um, the trade routes that brought luxury goods like silks and spices and all this. You might have some dim memory of this from your high school history classes. Um, it also, uh, kind of the, the process of uh, kind of closing in on Constantinople by the Turks led to an exodus of, uh, let's say, scholars, intellectuals from Constantinople to other places because they wanted to get out of Dodge, you know, before the Turks took over, as it looked like they were inevitably going to. And... Uh, where they often fled to were places like Italy, and they brought with them some of the sort of cultural treasures that had been preserved, you know, from, from antiquity. And this is part of the reason why uh, we, we look at that time as the beginning of the Renaissance, right? So 1450 marks the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance. What does that word Renaissance mean? It means rebirth. Okay, well, what was it that died and needed to be reborn? I guess if we were to put it in a single phrase, the thing that had died throughout the Middle Ages and needed to be reborn after 1450 was basically what we might call the spirit of antiquity. That is, people, uh, historians, looking back at this time said, aha, there was something, something grand and marvelous about ancient times, about the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome, uh, which kind of died with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, at least in Europe, and was even actively suppressed by the church, because the church comes into its own as the most powerful institution during the Middle Ages. And a lot of that old sort of pagan uh, culture uh, and what we might call a humanistic culture, was suppressed by the church. Okay, so as we get to the end of the Middle Ages, uh, um, the, a lot of that kind of culture, which had been preserved in Constantinople, the old capital of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, this stuff is coming to light again and being rediscovered. And it's, lead, it's sparking sort of a rebirth in culture. Now, a lot of other things are contributing to this rebirth in culture around 1450. Huge one is the inventing of the, uh, of the uh, printing press. Right. In, right around the same time, about 1455 in Germany, if you've heard of Gutenberg. Gutenberg actually didn't exactly invent printing, but he did invent printing with movable metal type. And the invention of printing with movable metal type brought down the cost of books tremendously. 
During the Middle Ages, books were, of course, copied out laboriously by hand, right? And who was it that was doing this laborious copying out by hand? Well, basically the only literate people, the clergy, right? Which meant that the clergy had control over which books would get written in the first place and which ones would not. And also, the books were so expensive because they were all handmade, right, that it just wasn't worth it for the average person to be able to read. Why would you go through the time and trouble to learn to read if there were so few books? If your average book cost like a, a year's pay, you know, why would you even bother? There's nothing around to read. Why bother to read? Well, if the price of books comes down, and if there's many more books in circulation, and if we have all kinds of interesting stuff that's being rediscovered, right? The knowledge and the culture and the literature of antiquity, which is coming to light again, now we've got stuff to put in the books, and now the books can be made much more quickly and inexpensively, and now maybe it is worth it for the average person to learn to read, and you can see there's sort of a snowball effect that develops. Um, okay, now, there, there are many, many other aspects. I mean, you could study the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and really just the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. You could spend your whole life studying just that subject and never run out of interesting things to discover. But I have to, I have to try and limit myself and move on. We'll talk more about the Renaissance when we get there. For now, we're talking about the Middle Ages, and we're just sort of talking about the significance of the brackets around it. 450, fall of the Western Roman Empire. 1450, all the Eastern Roman Empire. Now notice how convenient it is. It just forms a nice thousand year period. Again, these, uh, these brackets aren't really real. The Roman Empire didn't even really fall in 450. It didn't fall on any particular day, right? It was declining for a while over a period of decades. And historians often point to different uh, events like the, the, the sack of Rome in, four, in 455 or the, uh, the, the stepping down, the retiring of the last Western Roman emperor in 476. Right? So there are a lot of different dates you could pick, but 450 is close enough. Right? On the other end, actually there is one important date when the city of Constantinople was taken by the Turks, and that's May 29th. 1453. But it's not as if anyone realized the significance of that, that it was going to end a whole era. And in fact, a lot of uh, scholars, historians will say, really, we can see the, uh, what is to become the Renaissance emerging in the late 1300s right? uh, and into the 1400s. So again, Probably 450 and 1450 are chosen as much as for convenience of math and making it a nice even number um, than for anything else. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're insignificant. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that dates are insignificant. I know a lot of times, you know, even history teachers sometimes teach history like this. They say, oh, forget about dates. Dates aren't important. Well, they kind of are, <laughs> um, at least in a rough sense. I mean, maybe knowing that May 29th, 1453 was the year that the Turks finally managed to capture Constantinople. You know, that's like trivial pursuit level. But you should know at least roughly like years or decades or centuries when things happen. Because if you don't know when things happen, you, how do you know what's a cause and what's an effect? How do you know what came before and what came after? So understanding dates is actually crucial to understanding history. Right? Okay. Um, so we are going to, we are going to, um, look at dates, um, and it, I, I guess I would say that for this class, the most important thing is we need to know the dates of these different eras. And we need to know in a rough sense when things were changing and, and why, you know, so we are going to have some dates. Um, okay, now why is it called the Middle Ages? Because it's in the middle of those two things, but, um, it's important to remember that the term Middle Ages is kind of meant to be a derogatory term. It's, it's meant to be um, a disparagement, meaning, oh, things were so great back in 
you know, the, the wonders of the ancient world, all the amazing accomplishments of the Greeks and the Romans. And then we have this thousand-year period of kind of like misery and ignorance and war and plague. And then we have this wonderful rebirth of the values and the culture of the ancient world. And this is why, of course, you see a lot of Renaissance art, Renaissance um, architecture and literature deliberately imitating the style of the pre-Middle Ages of the ancient world. Now, that's a very sort of simplified uh, view. Um, yes, probably none of us would have wanted to live in the Middle Ages. You probably wouldn't have wanted to live back in ancient Greece or Rome either, since, you know, in the Roman Empire, for example, about 40% of the people were slaves, right? Uh, and even those who were not slaves, most of them lived pretty, pretty hard lives. If you think there's inequality today, it's nothing like the Roman Empire. Um, now, uh, that being said, it's not like the Middle Ages was just one long thousand-year period where nothing much happened, where there was no progress, where people were, you know, let's say where there was no art, there was no culture, there was no literature, there were just poor people peasants toiling in the fields and then dying of the plague. Okay, that's, that is an oversimplification. There was progress in the Middle Ages, but it was slow progress, right? It was the kind of progress that you might not see over an individual lifetime. It was progress that happened over, say, generations, but there was progress and there was change. And in fact, we see this in the division of the, let's say, what is often called the Dark Ages versus the High Middle Ages. Um, when people talk about the Dark Ages, they often mean it to mean the same thing as the Middle Ages, but that's not really what historians mean by that. And, and uh, what they mean by Dark Ages is probably not what you think it means either. So the Dark Ages, so-called, are basically the early Middle Ages, roughly the first half of the Middle Ages, from, let's say, 450 up until, oh, maybe the year 1000 or so, right, roughly speaking. And then what we might call the High Middle Ages is from 1000 or so up to, let's say, 1450. And there is a, a change from one to the other, and it's reflected actually in that term, Dark Ages. What was dark about it? Oh, it was a dark time. There was plague and war and ignorance and... No, that's not what, not what they mean by dark ages. What we mean by that is, we today, historians, let's say, looking back at this time, are in the dark, more so about the early Middle Ages compared to the later Middle Ages. Why are we in the dark? Because there's much less in the way of written records about this time. That's what historians mean by a dark age. In fact, there's also, a, um, historians speak of a dark age in ancient Greek history, because there was a period of time when the, the ancient Greeks apparently lost the ability to write. They had known how to write. We have examples from before the Greek dark age, and then we have lots of examples afterwards. But there's a period of time in there of a few hundred years when the Greeks apparently lost the ability to write, because we just don't have any written records from that time. Similarly, it's not that we don't have any written records, but we have very few written records from the earlier half of the Middle Ages compared to the later half. Why might that be? Well, for one thing, uh, fewer people, much fewer people, were capable of reading and writing in the early half. In the later half of the Middle Ages, gradually there was a slight increase in literacy, especially among the nobility. Now, ordinary people, still illiterate. You know, the, the average person, the majority of the population of Europe, was illiterate until well after the Renaissance. Because again, what these people had to do in their daily lives, reading just wasn't required. Okay, so now I'm going to get into a little bit, you know, how society was structured, uh, what did people do, how did they live. In the Middle Ages, uh, what you have is an agrarian society. That is, a society where the vast majority of the people 
are directly involved in raising food, which is a very labor-intensive activity back then when you don't have tractors and combine harvesters and whatnot. The majority of people are needed just to raise the food, to feed everybody, right? And what do we call these people who are growing all the food? We call them peasants, of course. And most of the peasants uh, in Europe in the Middle Ages are also serfs. What is a serf? It's basically a slave. A serf is owned by the same guy who owns the land. If you are a landowner in the Middle Ages, you own not only the land, but the people who work the land. And those people cannot leave the land without your permission. Some of them did anyway, they escaped. Um, but let's say if you were a, a landowner and you decided to sell your land to the landowner next door, he would get the land and the people, right? So that's what serfdom is. Uh, the majority of peasants were serfs. Right? And, and that probably accounts for it's hard to know, we don't have a lot of data from back then, but I would say easily 95% of the population during the Middle Ages, and it changes from one given time to another, but 95% uh, of them were uh, peasants, and most of those peasants were serfs. Uh, what about the other 5%? Well, we could probably divide them evenly into the other two classes of society. So getting into the three classes of society. you got your peasants making up 95% of the population and their job, their role in society is to do all the work. Most of the work is raising food, but they do all kinds of other work as well. The other two groups, which each are maybe 2% of the population, are the nobility. The nobility are the landowning, and also the warrior class, and the clergy. Clergy is basically anyone who uh, works for the church, right? Which church are we talking about here? We are talking about what is today known as the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. There were no other churches back then. It's not in Europe. Now, depending on where you look in the Middle Ages, uh, there was a Western church called the, ultimately the Roman Catholic Church, and then there was an Eastern Orthodox Church, which is still in existence today. Um, now, the, the Western and Eastern half of the church kind of broke apart in the 11th century, right? So certainly after 1054, which is when the final split took place, you've got a Western church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. There are no Protestants yet. Protestant Revolution doesn't begin until 1517 with Martin Luther and all of that. Uh, now, there are a few uh, Jews in Europe. Uh, they are often a persecuted minority. They are, they are kept in, very often, in, in sort of walled-off neighborhoods known as ghettos. The original ghettos are, are Jewish neighborhoods. Jews were subject to various restrictions, um, and very often when something bad happened, it was the Jews who were blamed for it. So it was, it was a tough time to be a Jew in the Middle Ages. Jews were not allowed to own land, uh, which is why very often they went into other trades. They went into banking, for example. So, um, but otherwise, everybody was a Catholic. And another thing, a very important thing to keep in mind is, during this time, people took religion very literally and very seriously. Probably much more so than most people today. Uh, and that's why the, one of the reasons why the clergy had so much power. Now, you might think, of the three classes of society, the nobility must be the most important, right? The most powerful. No, it was the clergy that were the most powerful class of society in the Middle Ages. For one thing, because of their role, now what's the clergy's role? We know what the peasants' role is, they do all the work. The landowners, uh, well they own the land, but their, their role is also to fight. In the event of a war, it's that warrior class, the nobility, who will fight and protect the other two classes. That's how it works in theory anyway. What's the clergy's role? Their role is the most important. 
because their role is to save your soul. Their role is to try and get you into heaven instead of the other place. And when you think about it, from the medieval uh, point of view, what could possibly be more important than that? So in order to understand medieval times, and even ultimately medieval music, which we will get to, you kind of have to understand the medieval mindset, which in many ways is different from the mindset that we have today. And it's hard to generalize about the mindset of millions of people, but I'm going to do it anyway. It, simply put, it's this. Life here on earth, what's it all about? Well, it's nasty, it's short, it's violent. You never know from one day to the next when you're going to die. You could die of some disease, the bubonic plague. You could easily die in a war. You could die in childbirth. Probably as many women died in childbirth as men died in war. You could just die from any kind of a natural ailment that today we have easy cures for. Because, of course, back then, doctors had no idea what they were doing. Right? Um, so the important thing was to keep your mind not on this life here on earth and this world, but on the next life and the next world. Your time here on earth, if you're lucky, might be, I don't know, 50 years, right? Nothing. It's a blink of an eye compared to the time that you will spend either in heaven or in hell, which is forever, right? And beyond that, your time here on earth should be seen as sort of like a trial, a period of testing, a period of suffering, but also testing. And if you can get through this period of suffering and testing and trials and temptations and whatever, with your soul clean, then you can go to heaven. And if not, you're going to hell. Um, and how are you going to know if your soul is clean? Well, that's where we, the clergy, come in. We, anointed clergy, are the middlemen, basically, between God and you. So if you want to know what you have to do, to avoid hell and get into heaven, you must do as we say. You must do everything that we say, and you must not question what we say. Because, after all, you're illiterate. What do you know? <laughs> even Remember, even the nobility mostly were illiterate up until, let's say, roughly the year 1000 or so, and the nobility take more of an interest in education for various reasons. Um, but the vast majority of people were illiterate. And even if they were able to read, it was forbidden, not just discouraged, but forbidden for ordinary people to read the Bible. Now, this might seem kind of crazy to us today. We're all encouraged to read the Bible if we're Christians. We have Bible study, right? But that's a relatively modern idea. That's an idea, really, that we can uh, trace back to Martin Luther, who initiated the Protestant Reformation. Before that, the Catholic Church's teaching was... No, no, no. You should not be reading the Bible on your own because you haven't been trained. Even if you're able to read, you have not been trained in theology and you have not been ordained like us clergy. If you start reading the Bible, you are liable to misunderstand, misinterpret it. And that misinterpretation, that error leads to sin and sin leads to hell. So don't try reading it on your own and getting ideas in your head. We'll do that for you. We'll tell you what it says and what you have to do. So just listen to us and you'll be okay. So uh, you can imagine the power that the clergy had in a society where people take this stuff very literally and very seriously. So the clergy are, number one, the, the only educated class of people through much of the Middle Ages. The clergy needed to be educated and by educated, I mean, at minimum, literate to do their job. They need to be able to read and write, right? Actually, there were, even, there were some illiterate clergy as well. But let's say most of the clergy, certainly in the bigger towns, uh, could read and write. And that's a, that's a powerful ability in a society where most people cannot read and write. Not only that, but they spoke their own language, which most people could not speak, and that's Latin. Latin uh, is not a dead language. Um, during, during the Middle Ages, it was the language of all the clergy. The clergy wrote to each other, corresponded, spoke to each other in Latin. 
most of the, the liturgy, that is the church services, almost all of it was done in Latin. Right? Only, in, only in the 1960s, right? not long before I was born, did the Catholic Church start having its services in the vernacular languages, that is, the locally understood languages like English or Spanish or French or whatever. Up until then, all Catholic Church services were conducted in Latin. Only the sermon would have been given in the vernacular language. Right? So, uh, for various reasons, the clergy are really the most powerful class of people uh, during the Middle Ages. Um, here's the way to think of the church in the Middle Ages. It's sort of like a big multinational corporation, and the CEO is the Pope, and there are various bishops and priests and friars and monks and nuns, or whatever. There's a whole hierarchy, um, sort of a loose organizational scheme, but the church as an institution is really more powerful than any individual king or queen or whatever, or duke or, or other member of the nobility in any particular region or country where the church does business. Right? And its business, of course, is saving souls, the most important business there could possibly be. Um, by the way, there, are, there is quite a bit of overlap between these classes at least between the clergy and the nobility, and also between the clergy and the commoners. Uh, the commoners are basically, you know, the, the peasants, um, the, the non-nobility. So there are a lot of uh, nobility who were also clergy. Uh, and very often in those days, you know, since, the, since the, the church was like this big multinational corporation, if you were a wealthy nobleman, you might want to encourage one of your sons, or encourage, force one of your sons uh, to become a, a priest or a bishop so that you have a connection in that big, powerful, multinational corporation known as the church. Right? So there were a lot of members of the clergy who were also members of the nobility. There were also a lot of members of the clergy who, who were drawn from the ranks of the commoners. So humble parish priests, uh, friars, uh, monks, right, might be of common origin. Right? Now, this is the, the sort of the basic framework. These, these three classes of society, and they each have a role. Right? In, and that's how it works in theory. In practice, it's quite a bit messier than that. Right? Um, and there are all kinds of contradictions and exceptions and weird situations uh, which might differ from one place to another, because we're talking about really all of Europe during this time, so it's hard to generalize. But that's sort of, it's good to start out with the general picture. If we're going to understand anything about medieval music, we have to understand the culture that it came out of. And the thing to understand about medieval culture is, well, we've got three classes of society, and they're pretty rigid, they're, they're well understood. You can tell what class somebody is in from a mile away, because just for one thing, the way they're dressed. Right? If you were a commoner, there are there very often these laws called sumptuary laws. If you were a commoner, even if you could afford nice clothes, it was illegal for you to wear them, to go out looking all fancy, because that would be like misrepresenting yourself, right? And of course, you could tell a member of the clergy from far away because they'd be wearing their clerical garments, you know. Uh, they were probably wearing some kind of a robe. So it was important that people know which class you were in. And, and to this day, Europe is a much more class-oriented society than America is. And I think, sadly, um, uh, there are Americans who try and uh, overlay that structure on American society. But the whole idea of American society in this country is that we are going to try, at least, to throw off that old burden of class. There are no titles of nobility in the United States. It was, it was a deliberate thing. We do not have a king. We have a president. And 
all men are created equal and all that stuff. We'll get to that much, much later, and when we get to the Enlightenment. For now, we're stuck in the Middle Ages. All right. Okay, so let's try and circle around and uh, get a little bit closer to the subject of music. So given what we know uh, about the structure of society, uh, how does music fit into this? Well, um, there are two large categories of music in the Middle Ages. And if we have to start breaking it down into different compartments and categories, the place to start is with secular music on the one hand and sacred music on the other hand. So whenever I talk about a piece of music, a genre of music from the Middle Ages, the first thing you should think about is, oh, wait a minute, is this a secular type or a sacred type? That's the first important distinction. Okay, so what do those terms mean? Sacred, I think you probably know what that means. It means having to do with religion in some way. Um, so music that is created for church services, or is inspired in some way by religion, or has a religious function or purpose, that's sacred music. And there are lots of different subtypes of sacred music, but that's the, the big category. Secular just means having nothing to do with worship or religion or God. Right? So, love songs. There have probably always been love songs, uh, and... Love songs are a type of secular music. Uh, instrumental music for dancing to. Secular music. All right. Given what, what I just said about society in the Middle Ages, which type of music could we suppose is more important during the Middle Ages? That is, more likely to be written down, important enough to write down and preserve. Sacred music. We are, we are in a time, the Middle Ages, that is, you could almost say, a theology, right? where things of the sacred realm are much more important, remember, than things of this earth. The church, which has kind of a powerful grip on people's hearts and minds, is constantly trying to reinforce the idea, look, forget about things of this earth. That's just temptation, right? In, instead of looking down... Look up. Keep your thoughts and your heart up there with the eternal, right? The sacred realm is, the, is much more important than, than this mere earthly realm of secular things. So, for that reason, <clears throat> we could say that sacred music in the Middle Ages is more important than secular music. We can also definitely say that there is much more sacred music which has been preserved <clears throat> written down, then there is secular music. There is some secular music that's written down, but not nearly as much. A secular musician might not even know how to read and write music. Remember, you don't need to know how to read and write music to, to play music or to sing songs or whatever. Right? It helps, but it's not absolutely necessary. So there was probably a great deal of secular music which simply wasn't written down and is therefore just kind of lost. Um, now, there's probably quite a bit that was written down and is also lost just because it was so long ago. Right? But we have much, much less secular music that has been preserved compared to sacred music. Um, we will talk about the different genres that we're going to plug in on either side, over here on the secular side and on the sacred side. What the book does is it starts talking about music in general and then talks about sacred music and really the, the most important, uh, the place to start with sacred music in the Middle Ages, sort of the, the basis of all of it really, is chant. Gregorian chant or plain chant as it's called. So that's what they start with. Then they talk about a couple of different types of secular music and then they go back to talking about a different type of sacred music called organum. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going I'm to present that same material but instead of jumping back and forth between sacred and secular music, I'm going to have like a couple of lectures on sacred music and maybe a lecture or two 
on secular music. Here's one big important distinction between sacred and secular. I mean, right off the bat, we know that secular means having to do with things of this earth, and sacred means having to do with religion. But um, the sacred music of the Middle Ages was, first of all, all vocal, right? And meaning vocal without instruments, what we call a cappella. Now, you've probably heard that term a cappella before. Uh, and you say, oh yeah, I know what that means. That's when you're singing without instruments. Actually, literally, a cappella is Italian for as in chapel. Cappella means chapel. That's because there was sort of a rule, a law, that when you are in a Christian chapel, you are not to play instruments. You may only sing. Why? Why is it such a big deal having instruments in a Christian chapel? Well, it's because, remember that when we looked at ancient Greek religious observances, we said, oh, they played instruments in their pagan temples. In the temple of Apollo, they would play the kithara. And in the temple of Dionysus, they would play the aulos. The playing of instruments is, as part of a religious observance, was seen as a pagan practice to be discouraged. We are Christians. We don't do any of that nasty, weird pagan stuff. When you are in a Christian chapel, you may use only the instrument God gave you, the human voice. Right. So, uh, sacred music of the Middle Ages is strictly a cappella, no instruments. Now, for every rule, there's an exception. We do see um, the introduction of, let's say, organs in churches, pipe organs, beginning, it's hard to say, but certainly by uh, the year 1000 or so, a few larger churches have pipe organs, but they're only used on special occasions. We could say that church bells actually are a kind of an instrument as well. So again, there are exceptions. And, and we also see that in certain places, there's sort of a local tradition of using instruments in church. Even though the Pope in Rome might not like it, if you are, let's say, in a, a strong independent city-state like Venice, for example, in Venice, they had a, a long tradition of using instruments in church, and that's just kind of like what they liked. And the Pope wasn't really in a position to do much about it. So, you know, again, rules are often there to be bent or broken. But nonetheless, there was a rule, and that's where we get the term a cappella. Um, here's another rule, by the way. Women were not allowed to sing in church. In fact, they were not even allowed to speak in church. And the reason for this, it goes back to uh, one of the letters of St. Paul. I think it's Corinthians. Um, I should probably have Googled this beforehand, but you can Google it. There's a famous line from, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, it might be from Romans. It says, let your women be silent in the church. Right? Meaning women were not to speak in church. And if St. Paul says, this is what you have to do, then remember Take this stuff literally and seriously. So women were forbidden to speak or sing in church. But there's an exception. The exception is, if you are a nun, and you are within a convent, which is a closed-off community of nuns, a, a sort of a self-sufficient, closed-off community of nuns, and you are in your chapel services in the convent, then you may sing. But if there are like men and women together, then no, 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 you can't sing in church. Of course, you have convents for women, and on the other hand, you have monasteries for men. Uh, that's the equivalent for men, where you have monks, and they do a lot of the same kind of things. And I'll talk about that probably in more detail next lecture, because a lot of this early church music that we see were, was composed and performed by monks in monasteries and or nuns in convents. Here's another important thing about sacred music. Of course, this is music that is uh, performed as part of some kind of a church service, almost always, right? And church services in that time were in Latin, which means that the text, the words that are being sung, are pretty much all in Latin, right? I'm going to talk about one exception to that. There's one 
a uh, very well-known uh, sort of chant or sung prayer, part of the Catholic Mass called the Curie. The Curie is in Greek, but all the rest of it is in Latin. So all of this Gregorian chant that we're going to be looking at, it's all in Latin. Secular music, on the other hand, well, if there's words, like, like if it's a love song, then it's not going to be in Latin, because Latin is not the language that most people understand. It's going to be in one of the vernacular languages. If you're in France and you're singing a love song, it's going to be in French. If you're in Spain, it's going to be in Spanish. If you're in Italy, it's going to be in Italian, etc. Right? So it's all the, the secular vocal music of the Middle Ages is in the vernacular. When I say the vernacular, it's, it's not one language. It's just a term we use to mean the commonly spoken language wherever you are. We also have some instrumental music. Uh, and this is mostly music for dancing. Now, there's very little of this that was written down. In fact, as I said, secular music in general wasn't written down uh, nearly as much, and, and not until later in the Middle Ages. Right? So, as we will see, like the earliest uh, sort of large body of written secular music is from relatively late in the Middle Ages, like the 1100s, the 1200s, the 1300s. We have hardly anything from before then, because secular music was, A, just not considered important enough to write down. It was passed along orally. Right? Um, and B, the people playing this music, most of them probably couldn't read and write music. The only people who really needed to know how to read and write music were the clergy. They needed it for their job, right? So, it's another important point. In the Middle Ages, most important musicians, by important, I mean actually trained in music, able to read and write music, most important musicians were members of the clergy, priests and also uh, nuns. Um, and the first composers that we will look at are a couple of priests and a nun. Chronologically, some of the earliest composers that we know by name are a couple of French priests who were also choir directors at Notre Dame Cathedral. Their names were Léonin and Perrotin. And also around the same time, uh, a very uh, interesting, one of the most interesting people in the Middle Ages, Hildegard von Bingen, who was a nun. She was sort of a mother superior. She ran a big, important convent in Germany. Okay, uh, I think I'd probably better wrap up here because I'm just kind of uh, getting a little bit long. It's going to take long for this one to, to upload. But we're at about normal class time, about 50-something minutes. So, um, just uh, read through the book. Uh, try and pick up on some of these terms that I presented here, like this distinction between sacred and secular, the 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 structuring of society, all that stuff is going to be important as part of the sort of the backdrop of this big picture that we are going to create in your head as you head into the next test, oh, roughly three weeks from now. Okay, so we'll talk more specifically about sacred music in the Middle Ages next time. See you then.